Today in the Alamo Music Sound Lab, we're going to get paraphonic. We're going to get a little bit deep into this Korg Monopoly. Stick around, check it out, it's coming up. I'm Roland Perez. This is the Alamo Music Sound Lab. Be sure to check us out online at alamomusic.com and hop on our YouTube channel and subscribe. There's a lot of great videos coming up with more synthesizers and more effects. Keep an eye on it. Today we're checking out the Korg Monopoly. And it's exactly that. It's a monophonic synthesizer and it's a polyphonic synthesizer, but it's not like your typical synthesizer. It's paraphonic. And as a keyboard player, as a synthesis for 30 years, paraphonic keyboards weren't really my kind of thing because you really have to play them a little bit differently than you would a typical synthesizer. Um, there's certain things about a paraphonic synthesizer that you cannot achieve in another keyboard and vice versa. So we're going to take a look at some of the cool features of this monopoly and some of the cool features about paraphonic synthesizers in general. Paraphonic synthesizers kind of got started back in 1978-ish when Roland unveiled their GR500 synth uh, guitar synthesizer. Uh, that synthesizer was paraphonic and it was really one of the first devices out there that utilized paraphonic uh, synthesis capabilities. The RS505 string synthesizer by Roland was very much a fluid type playing synthesizer. It was not quite like the different way you have to manipulate the keys on this chord monopoly. Um, to me, the monopoly was the first synthesizer that utilized paraphonic synthesis, much like the Moog Matriarch. Um, how one voice steals the other from when you press different keys at random. Uh, it, this was definitely more notable on the Monopoly synthesizer than it was the previous Roland RS505 and that Roland guitar synthesizer. That doesn't mean you really can't play it with effectiveness. You really can, you just have to play it just a little bit differently. Um, when I show you some of the sounds and some of the tweaks I'll be doing on the key bed, you'll really get to see how playing it differently will yield better results. Uh, but for now, let's talk about some of the features on it. This is a four oscillator synthesizer. You have one, two, three, and four, and each one of them has its own level, its own tuning on the uh, two, three, and four. Uh, oscillator one has its master tune here, and everything below it kind of falls into line from the master tune. Uh, you have the different waveforms. You have pulse width, pulse width modulation. You have your sawtooth, et cetera, et cetera. And of course you have the octave range. This is kind of cool because if I'm in poly mode, I can say, for example, press one note and have it uh, play, for example, a sawtooth, and it would be at a very particular octave that you would designate. If I clicked on another note, that second oscillator comes in and that could have a different octave range with a different waveform. And of course, three and four would follow the same way. That's really interesting and that's pretty powerful. Uh, because if you played four notes on the key bed, you could really make this thing sound like it's four synthesizers going at once because every single one of these essentially is a different synthesizer. Now you don't have to play it that way if you don't want to. You can of course set all of the VCOs to the same octave range, select the same waveform and play a four note thing and you've got your typical stab on a synthesizer, your chord structure or pad, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you do have a detune that's pretty cool for kind of like tweaking out just a little bit more of that flexibility on the tuning thing. Uh, I will say this, if you do have, for example, say sawtooth across and you have the same octave range, slightly detuning the tuning of three, uh, two, three, and four can make this thing sound really, really massive. A huge sound that almost sounds kind of chorusy uh, in a very huge way. That's one of my favorite ways of playing the synthesizer. Beyond the four oscillators, you've got your typical envelope section. You've got your filter envelope, your uh, VCF envelope, VCA envelope. Uh, you also have a noise generator that's your typical white noise thing. So, you know, nothing too special about that, but kind of cool if you're doing a wind effect, so to speak. Uh, you've got your portamento right over here, which is pretty typical of a synthesizer. And on this section, this is kind of where the fun stuff starts. You've got two LFOs on here. And of course, they can be controlled with the modulation wheel, the MG1, uh, or you can uh, have them assigned to pulse width modulation, which is really, really fun. You can also engage the effects button right over here to navigate what that LFO is going to do and where it's going to go. 
that's a pretty wild thing, and I'll show you more of that later on in a demo. But it should be noted that although it says effects on it, it's not your typical effect. It's not going to be a reverb. It's not gonna, really going to be a chorus. It's not a delay. It's more of, say, for example, X Mod. You can kind of get it to like the FM territory a little bit on there. And of course, it's all about the sync mode. Of course, you can also assign it to pulse width modulation and the filter itself. So a pretty powerful LFO section here. And I should say that LFO on this keyboard is labeled MG. So beyond that, we've got our pitch and mod wheels and we have a really cool arpeggiator. The arpeggiator is assigned to MG2, well, that LFO2, and that can be controlled by just the notes in itself, or you can have the notes alternate on the arpeggiator. So for example, if I was doing a four note stab with the arpeggiator on, you could have each note of the arpeggiator trigger a note from each oscillator at random. That's pretty cool. I don't know of any of the synthesizers that really do that the way it does, but I like it. I like it a lot. It's really musical. We also have uh, a different uh, way of kind of controlling the synthesizer. Where on the poly mode, you've got unison and poly mode. You also have mono modes. Mono modes, to me, is a very underrated aspect of this synthesizer. Honestly, half of the time I use this keyboard, it's always in mono mode. And the basses that I get from this thing are massive. Why? Because I'm running four oscillators in mono mode. That's pretty sick. Uh, you can also have it assigned to chord memory, which is kind of cool. I've never been wanted to the chord memory thing. It's kind of where you like play a chord and you hit the button. Then if you play a single note, it'll generate that chord you'd kind of record it onto that button. Um, might be useful for some people that know, don't know how to play very well. Uh, but for the most time, uh, most part, I really don't utilize that function. And of course, you do have the hold function, which holds the key bed in place once you click that button. Really useful for when, you, when you're engaging the arpeggiator section. Taking a, uh, a look outward, if you take a look at the graphic design and the build design, this looks very much like a Korg Poly 6. Poly 6 and the Monopoly kind of came out at the same time, right? Well, the Poly 6 was more of a typical synthesizer. It was kind of meant to em emulate or being rival to the Juno 106, so it had a lot of the features of the, of the Juno 106. The Monopoly was Korg's very, very different attempt at getting to something kind of wild and kind of different, right? Uh, because it doesn't really operate like your typical synthesizer. I really think that their main focus was getting into the Poly 6 thing and then releasing this along with it as kind of like a little side keyboard thing, see how the people like it and see how it generate, uh, or generated interest. Um, and that said, it really didn't gen generate a whole lot of interest when it first came out. Uh, speaking of which, it came out in 1981, and it, was, it ran through to 1984 in production. During that time frame, when people would see the Mono Poly right next to a Poly 6 at a music store, and they'd play both of them, they'd be like, what the heck is this? I really can't do what I usually can do on a synthesizer, so the biggest seller was the Poly 6. It wasn't until a few people just kind of bought one on a whim and really learned to get the most out of playing it and playing it its own particular way. Uh, this keyboard has been on a lot of soundtracks. It's been on a lot of albums. And I think once you hear it, you'll say, oh, I have heard that before. And had it not been for this keyboard, those sound textures and, and the way it did its thing would never have been around. And I really do think that this did pave the road for future polyphonic or paraphonic synthesizers, like that Moog Matriarch, which to me plays very, very similarly to this. Although the sound is a little bit different, they both operate the same way. How about the connectivity? Well, on the back panel, you've got a lot of stuff, and it's really great stuff. You've got CV in and out, which is always awesome. Your trigger is right there as well. You do have an arpeggiator trigger in, which is fantastic if you're trying to clock to an external drum machine. So just like I mentioned on a recent Jupiter 4 video, if you have an 808 or a 909 drum machine, you could send that clock out into the arpeggiator and have them synced up proper. Really cool for that. You also have a VCF input, so you can assign, for example, a foot pedal as an expression controller to the filter and also to the portamento itself. That's pretty neat. There's a lot of connectivity on the back that gets really creative really fast. Of course, you do have your output section, which to me is a very loud type of output. It's a lot louder than most synthesizers. I don't know if it was designed that way, 
but at nominal, say, unity level on a mixer, this thing's a lot louder than typical. So watch out for that. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say about this monopoly, jumping back to this front panel, is about the filter. Now, I'm a filter freak, right? So Roland filters are one of my favorites. Korg filters can be a little bit more thinner sounding than a Roland filter or a Moog filter, at least in, to my ears. This particular filter, and it's also on the Poly 6, is a lot edgier than your typical filter. I don't think it goes nearly as wide on the throw as, say, for example, a Moog synthesizer, but it does have this sharp kind of metallic thing going on to it, which can be very useful for some sound texture programming. Uh, not necessarily my favorite filter, but on this synthesizer, it really does a job fantastically well. So hats off to, to Korg for creating this really unique filter, uh, filter section. Okay, enough talk. Let's hear it in action. Thank <laughs> you. 
I really hope you enjoyed looking at this Korg Monopoly paraphonic synthesizer. It certainly is unique and it's just a joy to play. It's really a cool synthesizer. Be sure to check us out online at alamomusic.com. Hop on our YouTube channel and click on subscribe. We'll be talking about more keyboards like this here in the future. I'm Roland Pettis for Alamo Music. Thanks for checking us out.